Every time you go to a bar, the bar's got somebody who thinks he's as tough as a nickel steak. We all from the speed for the dough, Ray Me. Now get this. We partners, we brothers, and we friends. I'm- Fifteen years old. You think about that. You're way to hell. How about cutting heat? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boy, Jimmy. They were nine men. They were four families of brothers. They rode together from Missouri to Minnesota and from Texas to Tennessee. They were the most famous outlaw heroes of the West. They were known as the Long Riders. This is their story, and it's as close to the truth as legends can ever be. Now, you don't give us no trouble, mister. I want your sons, Mr. Samuel. What do you want them for? For robbing banks and trains, ma'am. What do you think your chances are of bringing them in? It's an amazingly stupid question. Wait for them to come out. People say they got one of the youngers. People say they got the wrong younger. You men did an excellent job of making heroes out of every one of those gentlemen. I think I'll write me a book. Make myself even more famous than I am. You ever been alone? Excuse me, miss. I was wondering if you cared to dance. I'd be delighted. Coming back for you. Gonna be meeting up real soon. They got a real fat bank up there. Scouted it out myself. Northfield. You open that safe, mister, you hear? The Pinkett had told us he might be coming. They're robbing the bank! David, Keith, and Robert Carradine as Cole, Jim, and Bob Younger. James and Stacy Keach as Jesse and Frank James. Dennis and Randy Quaid as Clell and Ed Miller. Christopher and Nicholas Guest as the Ford brothers. The Long Riders. Hello, folks, and welcome to Last Call of Torchies. Uh, we've been away for a while. Uh, it seems like I'm saying that on every show, because it's, it's fucking true, people. And I, I've missed all of this, so... <laughs> um, I'll introduce been my... been here waiting for you. Yes, I know, yeah. right? I love that about you guys, and I'm, I'm going to kick it you to my... The, hmm? You set up the call weeks ago, and Cameron and I have just been sitting on Skype for weeks. It's gotten a little awkward, to be Man. honest. Nothing to eat. My, wife, you know? my wife's been asking me to bathe. You know, it's yeah. kind of. <laughs> they got those wipes that you just you just clean yourself off. Now I'm playing. No, no. It's just, uh... 
damn, if only I'd have known. Shit. God damn it, guys. Yeah. It's a... That's why we need you, Gary. God damn. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, they're all they're all uh, going uh, already, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, who, who, who was introduced themselves first? Go, go, go ahead. You know, it's been a while. Uh, I'm Lee Russell. I do podcasts and things of that nature. He sounds oh. he sounds so awkward right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's how I usually sound on podcasts. It's he, fun. He can't flash those eyebrows at people like, like he does on Facebook, see. Yeah, I know. And I'm Cameron Scott. I also do podcasts and stuff and I'm styling and profiling my new razor sharp sideburns, but you can't see them. Man. You got a gold watch and a two thousand dollars suit too, you know. For that, you know, yes, hey. I do. A little pinky ring. Do it, man. What's going on? <laughs> gotta gotta get behind the Legion pay well for for the real good stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> that's that's where the sexiness is. Speaking of which, I we've been together, we've been away for so long, you know. I'm on a, on a, on a, a podcaster's high because I got to record with my brother X earlier and my brother Derek. So I'm gonna open a beer for this show. Here it comes. Oh, oh there you go. And I never drink on a podcast, but there you go. <laughs> I always drink on a podcast. I have yeah. a beer open right here. See, I, I, I'm an old man. I fall asleep if I, if I use the, the slightest bit tipsy. So I don't, I don't drink anything on a podcast anymore. <laughs> it's the only way I can survive social interaction, whether it be online or in person. So, cheers, cheers, salute, salute. Yeah, I either need a strong coffee or a strong drink. One, one of the mm-hmm. two to deal with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're here today, tonight. It is a tonight uh, to discuss 1980, the year of my birth, uh, The Long Riders, which is a massive cast, of course, you know, directed by Walter Hill, but this time uh, written by some other guys, Bill Bryden, Stephen Smith, and Stacy Keach, who's... Celebrating his 80th birthday today, people, so celebrate. Wow. Yeah. Nice, nice. Sergeant Stadenko still kicking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this, of course, is about the Younger James gang. Uh, t- towards the end of that gang, because they, they, they obviously break up, uh, you know, eventually, and that happens in this movie, and what happens uh, happens to Jesse James uh, at the end of this movie. But um, I'll, I'll introduce you to the cast, because it's, uh, it's all... It's all brothers in real life, which is very cool, which is a, an idea, because I think George Roy Hill was going to make this movie, and he was against the whole idea of casting all these brothers. And I say, okay, you know. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it works so well in this movie, guys. Um, yeah, it does. David Carradine and Keith Carradine play Cole and Jim Younger, um, respectively. Uh, Stacy Keach and James Keach play Frank and Jesse James. Um, Dennis Quaid, short time in this movie, uh, plays Ed Miller. Uh, Robert Carradine, uh, plays Bob Younger. I should have mentioned that, I'm sorry. Uh, Randy Quaid plays Clell Miller. You know, one of those serious Randy Quaid moments where he, yeah, lost his mind or whatnot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Or he uh, went all Gary Busey on us. Man, he did go sure. Busey. They got kind of serious again, because if you get the Blu-ray, the, and I haven't gotten this yet, I'm mad at myself, the Kino Blu-ray, he has a new interview on there about this movie, and huh. I'm curious where that goes. Um, <laughs> Christopher Guest and Nicholas Guest as Charlie and Bob Ford. Uh, Pamela Reed, she got a nice ass, people, I gotta tell you, because this movie, I, I found that out. as Bell Star. <laughs> Uh, James Remar plays a, a half Indian, I guess you would call him, in Sam Star in this movie. <laughs> oh, man. Harry Carey Jr., Western classic, shows up as George Arthur. There's a lot, there's lots of people in here. A lot of love went to this one. And, um, this is a passion project for the Keach brothers. And, um, it, it shows because, um, I, I, I yeah. They played the Wright Brothers in 1971 in a, in, a, in a film called The Wright Brothers, and they gave him the idea to portray Jesse, Jesse and Frank James, and um, James uh, started writing, started off by writing a play about the James Brothers, which, which Stacy financed and produced. They staged it at the Bucks County Playhouse and then toured it through schools in New Jersey. So that would have been something, you know. Hmm. 
to be a fly on that wall, huh? Man. Yeah. Well, I, I think Stace Keach is a guy I want to hang out with anyway. Just his, He seems like a real gruff dude that you can get high with or drunk with or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and as much as he's always done, I always see him as tight as his dad. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's kind of... I like. I totally forget the rest of that fucking show, but like, that is one thing I do remember from. <laughs> right. And every, and every time I think about him, I think about him as he looks there, pretty much. So. Right. Right. That and um, if you're a Thirty Rock fan, the the Couch Town promo. If you remember that episode, it was a. Uh, it's pretty epic. This was an episode <laughs> in which um, Alec Baldwin's character Jack Donaghy uh, built couches. But he, they, he built them all fucked up, so they use it as a war against terror, uh, weapon against terrorism. So <laughs> doing these couch town promos is just Stacy Keach says something about like, if you're a man, you like a couch or some shit like that. I forget what it is, but if I if I if I find it, I'll put it at the beginning of this episode just be, just because I want to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right on, right on. Oh my gosh, but um, I'll kick it to Cameron first. Uh, thoughts and. Whatever uh, on this great movie. Oh, pardon my French, but I fucking love this movie. I've always loved this movie. Uh, I, I watched this with my grandfather for the first time when I was probably about <clears throat> seven, maybe eight years old. You know, I was probably about like 82, 83. And whenever my gr- grandpa would babysit me, there was always Westerns on. Yeah, that or Burt Reynolds movies. But I got introduced to this movie, and that's how I learned about the you know the Carradines uh, I learned about the the Keeches and the Quades and it's the epitome of what I love in a western Walter Hill was channeling a lot of uh, what I thought uh, uh, Sam Peckinpah did in the Wild Bunch mm-hmm. here with the, with the action the action is very stylized very boisterous and god I love it I mean it's it's everything I love in a Western. I know I'm just repeating myself, but, uh, you know, it, whether or not it's a hundred percent historically accurate, it, it's pretty much right on, you know, from what I've gathered from my own, you know, delving into history books and whatnot. I, I like the fact that it didn't take too many liberties with things. And it's got that awesome fight scene between <laughs> David Carradine and James Remar. <laughs> You know, I, I, by awesome I mean not so much, <laughs> but, but it's a fun. It's fun. It's it's a, it's a fun movie, and all the subsequent characters and you know, people like Eddie Bunker uh, playing mm. small roles, Lynn Shay, Fran Ryan. It's got a great cast. It's it's got great music. I did not know though in uh, that Stacey Keach had uh, wrote it. I had no idea about that. So that was was uh, fun to get to know. But, but, yeah, I love this movie. Up, down, all around, one into the other. Everything about it is great. It's, uh, it, you know, I hold I hold it to all other westerns to a very very high standard. Basically, because uh, this movie and The Unforgiven, mm. two two totally different movies, I might say. But you know, uh, they're the the movies by which uh, all other westerns should be judged. And I'll leave it at that. Nice, Lee. I really like this. This movie sort of has a gimmick going for it with with the uh, all the real life brothers playing real life, you know, brothers from history. Um, it, it seems like maybe it'd be a little on the nose, but it just happens to be a bunch of really good to great actors doing it. So it's like, OK, we can let that slide. Um, I think it's pretty good. It feels like a sort of more meditative revisionist Western at this point. So, you know, where we're kind of in the days of where the Western is really dead now. And, uh, you only see one or two Westerns pop up here and there, and they're either like revisionist Westerns or they're silly and more comedic. Um, so this one is very meditative, uh, you know, all, all these guys post civil war with no direction. Um, and it's just sort of their lives sort of spiral spiraling, uh, out of control, um, it does take some liberties of history, but it is fairly straight ahead, uh, accurate as far as you can get, as far as accuracy with the uh, old West legends and stuff like that, because there's always going to be a lot of conflicting stories and a lot of bullshit, <laughs> but this, this seems to follow most of the 
established, accepted history that uh, sort of went on. Uh, I think the performances are all pretty good. I would, I'd say, um, James Keach is maybe a little bit miscast as the as the lead for as as Jesse. I I, I don't know if that works as much. Like this feels much more like Stacy Keach and David Carradine's movie. They sort of run away with it whenever they're on screen. Oh yeah, and and it's like it feels like almost feels to me like David Carradine just kind of like I need a fight scene and uh, <laughs> and you're gonna give it to me. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly how it went down too. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, given some of the shit he used to pull on sets, especially around this time, um, you know, like. The, the famous one on uh, Death Sport where he beat up the first director and they had to replace the director of a new guy because uh, he like insulted the co- uh, the co-star Claudia Jennings or, or whatever. So uh, he, he was he was not uh, he was not a guy you pushed around on set back back in those days. Uh, he was so full of himself. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if this ranks up uh, as one of my favorites of the ones we've we've seen uh so far I'll, you know given the fact that we've just done a bunch of uh walter hill classics that are all fucking great uh this one's probably at the bottom of that list so you know i'm not i'm not shitting on it or anything like that but um yeah for the most part this works for me quite a bit and uh, we will get into the details as we talk about it but yeah yeah i i i will agree with lee there but that doesn't mean that it's bad or anything, but I, I agree that um, that he was he was miscast in a way, but it it, it, it would have really broke up the vibe of this brothers production, which really came together from a lot of things falling together. Um, because James Keach uh, acted opposite Robert Carradine in a television version of the Hatfields and McCoys, and mentioned the project to him, and uh, Carradine suggested that he and his brothers play the younger brothers. And, um, it's basically like, hey, you want to do it? And then say, hey, yeah, we're going to do it. And then later they, they w- would get together, uh, <laughs> you know, by some happenstance, the guy from United Artists and they, they got, they got funding for the film. So I think that that brotherhood, uh, mo- motion happened in the, the making of the film and, you know, during the, the film that the chemistry was there, obviously. And mm-hmm. I really dig it. And it, you know it's 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 it moves at a pace that is to say, you know, it doesn't dwell on things too long. You get some some good. I I, I gotta say, irresponsible horse stunts in this movie, because uh, yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you you have to think that maybe one of them or five of them got hurt during some of these because they're they're jumping through big glass panes of of uh, w- with windows and. There's a point where they're trying to get away towards the end where they got the horses in the water. And I know horses are, are strong Oof. and they're trained for this, mm-hmm. but, you know, something bad could have happened there. Um, but you also get some great, you know, uh, responsible horse stunts where they're literally chasing down a train and jumping on top of the train. And it's it's all there on film. And with that great score... Um, I love the relationship yeah, between, uh, ooh, man, Pamela Reed in this movie <laughs> mm-hmm. with, with, with Cole Younger. He just the, the whole idea of, you know, their past relationship comes up and and um, the whole idea of, there's a scene in the film where he says, you still cost 15, I think that's the line, or I, I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> She's like, you see, if you lose, I'll charge you twelve and a half. We're like, yeah, she she she's kind of a whore still, but she's still, he still thinks of it as as his whore in in, in that town, and that's very possessive. But mm-hmm. their their rapport is, is is some things that I like in this film. Um, I gotta say, uh, some of the filming stuff here. Some of the film was shot in Parrot, Georgia. With the opening sequence being filmed in Leary, Georgia, the main street of Leary was covered with dirt to hide the asphalt road, along with many of the storefronts being modified to look authentic to the times. Um, so they did a whole, um, like they did with Public Enemies for, for, for Johnny Depp. They changed oh, yeah. Chicago to make it look like the 1920s, you know? Uh, I don't like that movie all that much. I, I, I prefer the War Notes uh, 
Dillinger. I, I like the work that went into it. I just you, like you said, it's a little it's a little off and a little long too. Because um, Warren Oates hmm? actually looks like Dillinger, like he's ugly, like Dillinger was. <laughs> Dillinger did not look like Johnny Depp. No. <laughs> I love Warren Oates and many things now, but he'll he'll always be Sergeant Hulk to me because because oh of God. yeah because because of what I, the what I grew up with, you know. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. He's always, I mean, he's always uh, Benny from uh, uh, Alfredo Garcia to me. So yeah, I, I saw Stripes at like six years old, and that was the wrong time to see Stripes. But I. I... <laughs> That was one of the only right time to see stripes. That was the only VH one of the only VHSs my uncle had. I hung out a lot over there, and yeah, Mm. stripes was a thing. Um, Yeah, funny and boobs. Funny, funny and boobs, man. I I I always credit just one of the guys for the first pair of boobs that I seen, but I think stripes beats that. I think you know. But they were Halloween was the first set of boobs I seen, but then again with stripes, both PJ Souls. So there you go. Mm -hmm. They were covered yeah. in the, the boobs were covered in mud though, so there's that. So, oh no, there's, there's the, that whole scene with PJ Souls where oh, she oh yes gets it on with Bill Murray, given the the Aunt Jemima treatment, you know that. Uh... <laughs> oh, here we go. Hill said the most difficult sequence was the one where the horses jump through the glass. We train them for three weeks, making them do jumps without the glass. Once you condition them to do that, we put the glass in. It's a big surprise to the horses. And they did. They'll do, only do it once. They had these different sets of horses for the second jump. Fucking obviously, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fucking fool me, horse. God damn it, you know. No, there's a lot of great scenes in this movie, though. Like, where we're um, like I said, the 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 the, the Rob and the train thing is probably one of my favorite things in the world because the the, the stunts done when they were involved in that, just them riding the horses. And riding them quickly, the stuntmen, obviously. I doubt the actors did any of this. Um, them being able to jump from the horse onto the train was really something. And mm. while the ho- while the train was obviously moving, because, you know, they don't have CG back in these days to do that sort of thing. And it's uh, really wild to watch. And uh, I'm glad the horses weren't hurt now. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because usually too many times you go into the IMD be trivia for for stuff like this and you immediately expect the three horses died in the making of this so you know, some of them got swept down the river and drowned or you know whatever the fuck you, you expect to see that all the time um oh, yeah that was like part of the course back then in the 70s and 80s yeah um i, f- I found this one interesting like it doesn't really have a it, it's very much like a big hangout movie for a lot of the for a lot of it and mm-hmm. it's it, it helps that you know it's all really good actors talking so it's it's not too boring although I, I do get a little tired of like barn dances and stuff like that like I, I could use a little less of that but it's it's interesting the movie doesn't really have a three act structure so much it, it just kind of fades out instead of burning out like you kind of expect like it it, it, it does linger quite a bit after the uh the sort of big final shootout where like half the gang gets killed and everyone else gets caught and and stuff like that. Um, so I, I, I found it interesting that they sort of went that direction with it. Although it kind of makes sense with, with Walter Hill sometimes it, sometimes he'll, you know, he'll linger, linger on the, the aftermath of stuff instead of uh, just ending with a big bang. Like a lot of movies would tend to do in this period, you know? Yeah. I think that, um, one of the weak points of the film, which is there's there's not many for me, but like, like you said, there's a lot of saloon scenes, a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but I do love when Randy Quaid, uh, t- he goes to go request his song the hard way. I think it, it's just people forget that he he acted in things that were pretty good back in the day, and mm-hmm. just go go look it up, guys, because he he, uh, he can't act past Cousin Eddie in Independence in Independence Day. It just Oh yeah, check check him out and uh, check him out in the fucking last detail. Yeah, yeah, for or sure. Mis- Missouri Breaks. Missouri mm-hmm. Breaks is another good good western brandy. You know, I think people underestimate him because they know him just as cousin Eddie, but he he could actually pull 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 it out when when he wanted to. He was he was good. Yeah, or he, he went he's, all busy on us. Yeah, yeah, he's either he's either cousin Eddie or he's the crazy guy who fled to Canada because he's afraid Hollywood is trying to murder him or some <laughs> shit. It's like. 
<laughs> I, yeah. I, think, I think one of the big things this does is though it, it takes it takes a lot of liberties with the audience and, and when I say that they assume, you know, when you watch this movie when you turn it on that you know about as much as the Keach brothers do about these, these, these people, these real life people and if you don't, you know, the movie can move at a pace to say, Okay, so so you know, they're brothers, I get it, you know, but why why should we care about this or why should we care about that? But the filmmakers know why they put that stuff in there, but the, the audience might not necessarily know why they put the little 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 beats in there about the mm. his, the history of these people, you know. I mean at the same at the same time, uh the film definitely is kinda still within that uh little genre of like the confederate revisionist kind of stuff with the you know the the lost cause that they that the noble lost cause that they they lost or whatever because uh a lot of the jesse james kind of films um they tend to romanticize them a little too much i feel because like when it gets down to it they these were all ex-confederate soldiers who were like half of them were part of uh, Quantrell's raiders and shit and they were just like doing guerrilla warfare uh, murdering and raping people and shit like that so it's like uh, the movie kind of this movie strays away from that doesn't really mention it all that much thankfully because <laughs> otherwise you'd have like no sympathy at all for any of these people at least I, I wouldn't oh yeah no <laughs> Well, the relationship but, with their with their women and you know stuff like that, you you you, you feel some kind of a compassion with them in that way. But they're they're so, pre- they're pretty cold throughout the movie, though, as far as like people realize that they're outlaws and that they should be respected to us to an extent. So when they come to mm-hmm. town, yeah, you know, they're they're all kind of kissing their ass in a way, but not all of them are. They're getting more fear than than anything else. It's yeah, it, it depended like. Like when the gang started and stuff, it depended where they went. It depended, you know, sort of where they went. Like if if they were doing stuff in the more southern states where there was, you know, sympathy towards them because, oh yeah, they they fought the good fight for us and we lost the war and and there's you know we're we're still gonna hide them or we're gonna you know look the other way and shit like that. But that happened less and less as like the law started targeting them and they were starting to get like all of a sudden they didn't have the red carpet rolled out for them in certain places. And they just sort of got, uh, pinned down basically after a while to the point where a lot of them had to either give up or get killed and then, you know, give up other people in the gang and other associates and stuff like that. And you sort of get that with this, like this is very, like I said, it's very much the winding down of these people's lives, like the last few years of their lives, because you got the pink, the, uh, what was it? The Pinkertons that are, yeah, or Pinkertons. Fuck, yep, the railroad yeah, guys. Mm-hmm, that are, like, hunting them down pretty relentlessly. And uh, so, like, it, it takes a toll. Uh, like, so you get get a little bit of their relationships and stuff to sort of humanize them and sort of understand that they're trying to build lives as their lives are close, quickly closing in to right. an end. And uh, so it, it works, you know, dramatically fairly well, I felt. Especially, again, with the actors. They're so good that it's like... Yeah, you can establish these relationships without any sort of like background and you can just sort of thrust these people into it and kind of understand what's going on and who loves who and who's like potentially cheating on who and what the fuck's going on and and I mean at the end of the at the end of the day uh it was just like Jesse James surrounded by a bunch of country bumpkins and not his original gang anymore, right? Like his his last incarnation of his gang basically were a bunch of like rednecks and shit he pulled out of the hills that weren't anywhere near as competent as the people he rode with beforehand yeah, it's true well, and in, yeah. in this movie you know i mean you got to think that as we've already said that they were at the end of their i guess you could say careers at their end of their run but these you know they were all bad guys they they were mm-hmm. they, you know they were glorified in the in the in the little trade paperbacks and in, in, the, in the news and the newspapers, I mean, but you know they were feared, but yeah. they were also you know, I think this movie manages to humanize them just a tad because you get to see like they did have families, you yeah. know they did have relationships, they had children, they had you know they got to forget you know you can't forget these guys were just just humans, 
flawed, mm -hmm. albeit, but you know, when they hit the end of that 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 run that they had, Jesse, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. his 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 gang was not what it once was. It was not built with confidants that he could trust and that he knew. It was like you said, it was a bunch of. You know, hill hillbillies from the the holler, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta mention this because he shows up in a lot of these movies. Um, first uh, score by Ry Cooter in a in a Walter Hill film. Uh, Cooter said that Hill had heard one of his records while making the film, and thought that my music had an atmosphere quality that he was looking for. Walter likes likes score to be part of his movie's environment instead of the factor that's driving it. And I've always looked at a film, at film music as an environmental issue. So that's uh he'll show up in the next movie too. We're, we're gonna do mm -hmm. uh, Southern Comfort. He does the score for that as well. Boy, does he ever! Yeah. Um, yeah, and the Cooter soundtrack, man. He's just went. <clears throat> that just mm -hmm. that's all I can say. Is, mm. Yeah, there's there's some good twang in there for sure. Um, I did one minute, one thing I did want to mention that I really appreciate, especially after, um, having done a lot of, uh, like silent movies in the last couple of years and stuff on my own podcast. Uh, there's a nice little nod to the great train robbery from 1903. Um, it's, it's where, uh, Bob Ford is assassinating Jesse James and it, and it shows him firing his gun at the camera and like the, sort of the like point of view, a shot, uh, and it's, it's basically direct lift from that uh, that uh, famous shot in Great Train Robbery that um, reportedly freaked out a lot of people who were, like, watching a character basically break the, f the fourth wall and look at the audience and shoot at them, basically. Apparently it shocked a lot of people back in the day when they were watching it on screen because cinema was such a new thing to so many people back then, right? So they, they didn't know what to expect. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, I'm going to kick it to Cameron. It asked him, um, any uh, scenes that stood out for him that he'd like to bring up that he hasn't brought up already? And, um, yeah, go for it, man. Oh, jeez. Well, I mean, I don't know what we can touch upon that we haven't already hit upon. Of, um, you know, I, I think a couple of the other cam cameos that we should mention is, uh, you know, Peter Jason is one of the Pinkertons. And let me just say mm. this, the Pinkerton Pinkertons were a bunch of motherfuckers. Oh yeah, they were not good guys either. They were they just had badges. They, they were mm -hmm. back then. They were they were as equally amount of bad guys uh, on that side. But just saying. But Peter Jason is one of the Pinkertons. Uh, we got uh, you know Remar showing up. Alan Graff, who was always a bit player in a bunch of uh, you know westerns and stuff. Uh, he shows up in Deadwood. He shows up in Universal Soldiers. So always a stunt guy. But I think that. The thing I walk walk away from this movie loving the most is David Carradine, mm -hmm. and he's not usually known <laughs> for being like I'm using air quotes here the best of actors. But I think this is probably one of his finest performances. If it, it felt very grounded, you know, and especially for this point in his career post uh, Kung Fu and everything, uh, I, I think it's a you know a, a great film, underrated. And when people mention certain westerns, you know, people always mention uh, you know, like ones I mentioned, Unforgiven. They mentioned Tombstone, the the spaghetti western trilogy, and things like that. I think this is sorely underappreciated. And that last gunfight, I gotta I gotta say, brutal, haunting. Mm -hmm. And one thing yeah. though, no one reloads. No one reloads. In this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it commits the movie one of the movie sins of never reloading. But I I can I I, I can I, I can look past that because when it comes to shooting action, there are few better than uh, Walter Hill. And hats off to him that this is a uh, penultimate uh, western. You know, with the exception with the exception yeah, of I, I'm so sorry the knife I like fight this scene. Quite a bit. It's uh... Even even with the uh, the sort of lingering hangout stuff and the barn dances, it still moves at a really quick pace. I, I found for the most part, uh, you know, the actors are all great. Um, I love that it was obviously a bit of a passion project. You know, like um, as Cameron is saying, Carradine is like really really good in this, and and I and I think you know Carradine's just one of those guys who, if he knew he was in shit, he wasn't gonna try. 
Um, right, right. And but when when he was in something that he he believed in and thought was great, he he gives it his all. And I mean, he uh, forfeited his profit to participate in this, and so did the Keach brothers. Uh, as far oh, as no their shit. profit, as as uh, percentages of uh, as executive producer, uh, so that they could get the budget up to where it needed to be, basically. Um, yeah, where where is that trivia note? I had it written down here, actually. Uh, in order to make the movie, Dave Carrey forfeited his customary profit participation, and the Keach brothers gave up their profit percentages as executive producer in order... Uh, that the Carradine brothers got the same oh got the same amount of profits uh, when the film went over its 7.5 million budget the Keaches forfeited their ag- executive producer fees there you go so that's what this they they did a little wheel and a deal and uh, uh, get this where it needed to be and I I think they made uh, double their budget eventually like it, it ended up like an eight million dollar budget I guess and they got to like 15 or something like that so they did okay. For, especially for back in in the day there, um, but yeah, this is uh, this is great. Uh, was, as mentioned, uh, Eddie Bunker in this. Always nice to see him pop up, even if he just pops up <laughs> as basically a thug to get shot. Um, I'll mention that there's the the redheaded uh, girl in this, uh, Amy Stryker. I think the actress is. She's quite cute. I appreciated that. I did and, as uh, well. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, no, this is this is good stuff. Like, like I said. Uh, probably at the bottom of the list so far as far as the Walter Hill stuff we've been watching uh, for the podcast, but uh, that's... It's not definitely not going to stay at the bottom of the list as we go along. We'll put it, put it that way. Cool. I, I, I have to agree about David Carradine. I think the reason why he was so good in this movie is that with the exception of, you know, the knife fight that he has with James Remar, he's, he's, pretty, mm-hmm. he's pretty reserved, and he kind of lets the other actors do their thing. Whereas if you watch a, a David Carradine vehicle, usually he's usually the star of this movie, so he's got to carry the movie, you know, as, yeah. as far as it'll go. But this, he's surrounded by by people, including family, and I think his reservedness, you know, if, if that's even a word, I apologize for my English, uh, mm-hmm. is is um. It's a big quality in this movie that he doesn't possess in many other movies because he doesn't have to carry the weight on his own in this movie. He has lots of lots of help to carry with him. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they they they're robbing the coach um, of Harry Carey Jr. and I, I forget the actor's name, but I've seen him in like forty seven things. Um, he lies about being in the war. Oh and, yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> he's like, yeah, go ahead and take his shit. He's lying. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite scenes of the whole movie because, like, yeah, that's that that's that old fashioned, you know, draft dodging, you know, attitude of the old timers to say, you know what, you fucking lied about going to war. Fucking take his shit. Take his goddamn clothes too while you're at it. Hey, he didn't say that, right, but I you know. just fucking love that scene. <laughs> mm. and then currently, currently, you know, apparently that like most of this is taken from stories, whether they're true or not, that actually uh, reportedly happened, you know? So th- that's one of the fun things about this movie. It's like, I didn't know too much about uh, the James gang and everything. So when I was originally doing research for this and, and watching it, I was like, so is this a real guy? And then I went down this rabbit hole trying to find these people. So like uh, the James Remar character, the uh, what's his name? Star. Sam Star. Uh, Sam Starr, actually apparently a real guy, um, but they're, it, it's amazing. A lot of these people, you know, it was from so long ago that there's really not that much about them. They're just like sort of satellite characters in this sort of myth of the James gang kind of thing. And in, even if you look on like sites from like historians and stuff, there's like, you know, a paragraph about Sam Starr. Oh, Sam Starr was a minor criminal who did this and that and married this person. And that's about it, you know? they don't have the extensive biographies so you can stick them in here and you can put them in a knife fight with Cole Younger in a bar <laughs> over a whore you know and and you don't who, who's who's to tell you you're wrong you know yeah you know, that knife fight might have happened it just might have been a different guy <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. it's easily just put Sam Starr in there you know mm-hmm. he was fighting for for the whore because that, that was his whore you know again very, very possessive but if there wasn't a little bit of love on there, I guess he wouldn't have been fighting for her to to possibly 
Get get death at a bar with, with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> interesting fight tactics. I, I wasn't going to say that. It was uh, it was interesting. Yeah. That old man. Um, and I have and I have to say, like, uh, kudos to Dennis Quaid for outcrazing Randy Quaid on screen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because he definitely plays the crazy one out of the two, and Randy plays the more reserved one of the two. It, it's. It's always I always forget about that every time I go to watch this. It's like, oh yeah, this is this is Dennis pulling out his best Randy shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was critically you know received pretty well and, and by by many critics and uh, including Lennon Ball and Gene Siskel, people people like that of the sorts, you know. Um, yep. But you know the box office. Um, didn't reflect that because it came out in 80 and uh, I think the quote is right here James Keach wrote a letter to the Los Angeles Times in response to an article on the poor box office performance of the westerns Keach claimed Long Riders uh, wasn't a Star Wars at the box office but recouped its full 9 million dollar investment and earned United Artists a profit uh, Stacey Keach wrote in his memoirs that I believe to this day that we've made money even though the studio claimed it only broke even and uh, you never can tell Especially nowadays, yeah. you know, because when so many films that we love were, were failures at the box office, you know, and I, I, I put that in air quotes, you can't see it through audio formats, but um, mm. made crazy amount of money after they were released to p- pick a John Carpenter film that's not Halloween, okay? Right. It's, it's, I mean, the Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, they're... they're, they're they they be, they, be, they became cult classics and they they're just classics now. And I mean, yeah, I mean those movies you know eventually made their money back and, and more, but like who got that money at that point? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so many years. Some, after. some executive that probably wasn't even born when the the movie came out. Right. But um, we said a lot about this one. I I, I really in, enjoyed this talk. Uh. Do we rate films on this show? This is how I disorganized I right now. I don't remember that far back. I don't think we do, though. <laughs> it's just, um, <laughs> I think he got from our conversation if we liked it or not, so go, go yeah. for that. Yeah. But, I think um, the best quote, uh, one quote I got I, written down here that I didn't touch base on, I for it, from Hill himself about this movie that sums it up perfectly. The jokes are funny, but the bullets are real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the consequences yeah. too. I mean, like 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 Lee said, the the end of the movie is. I mean, the the last gun gunfight is is pretty devastating. I mean, squibs. Well, in reality, yeah. uh, fucking uh, Cole Younger got shot eleven times back in the day when somebody who got you know shot once lost an arm or lost a leg or died from sepsis or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, so that was one tough old bastard. You know, oh, yeah. le- eleven shots and still lived to be seventy some odd years old. Yeah, and like Jesse James when he died, like he was what age thirty four or something like that. When he got caught up to, he had like like a shot off finger and other all kinds of other injuries and shit. Like these these guys came out of the Civil War, and like nobody came out of the Civil War unscathed. So <laughs> no. But um, yeah, that's about the end of this one. Um. Look, look for our Patreon uh, special episode. It can only be found on Patreon, which was Lee's pick. We're gonna do it every every time now. Everybody's gonna have a pick, and uh, because that's that's fair. And I'm I'm retarded. Uh, the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Look for that review on Patreon. That is coming very soon after this episode comes out. So look for that. Or before I haven't decided yet. I've been recording so much this week. I've been it's been a happy experience. But, um, <laughs> Lee, um, pimp your stuff, sir. Uh, yeah, you can find me at uh, tmbdos.podbean.com. That's for my podcast, They Must Be Destroyed on Site, where we do a little bit of everything. Uh, I've been kind of slowing down a little bit as of late, just because schedules have been conflicting and stuff like that. So we're kind of getting like an episode or two out every couple of weeks, basically, you know. Still not too bad uh, production-wise, but uh, definitely been slowing down on that a little bit. Um, also, by the time you hear this, uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, our major domo over here at Legion Podcast, Bo Ransdale, um, has his new podcast, The Dark Parade, 
and I was recently on an episode of that, as was uh, Gary as well. Uh, but uh, the one I recently did was uh, Let Me In, the uh, the uh, remake of Let the Right One In, uh, the American remake of uh, the vampire classic. Uh, so uh, check that out. It's a nice new little horror podcast going on that Bo's got going. So uh, it's good stuff. That's a film that makes you ask yourself, you know, was it necessary, but was it really that bad? I don't think it was that bad to me. I, I kind of, no. I could like both. Spoilers, Bo, Bo and I both liked it, and we kind of even talked ourselves into liking it a bit more by the time we finished our conversation. So It, it happens when you're talking about stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Cameron. Oh, well, I'm still kicking it. A Cinema Degeneration. Um, we're on... Podbean, everywhere else you can get find podcasts. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I do got some new stuff coming out. I got a new show called Without Warning where I surprise my good buddy Corey Dawson middle of the night because he's a night owl with a surprise uh, topic that he has knows nothing about. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of catching him off guard with those, and I'm gonna for gonna be recording through throughout the month of December for a new uh, appreciation month topic that we got where we're doing nothing but uh, Vincent Price films for the entire month of uh, uh, January. Are you so doing Dr. Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs? Because, you know, these, these are important the questions to ask. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I haven't scheduled that one yet. I have a couple. I got, uh, we're doing, uh, we just recorded the first one on the uh, last house, not last house on the left, geez. <laughs> last man on earth. And I'm mm. doing a Dr. Fives double feature tomorrow night and Sunday. I'm recording uh, one on the Tingler. Oh, yeah. I, I think comedy of terrors is very important though, because it makes me laugh so hard. Oh, yeah. comedy of terrors is great. Mm. And theater of blood and madhouse, like all all this later day AIP stuff is. Madhouse great. is like my personal favorite. Is yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's. Hands up between him and Peter Cushing, Robert Corey. That movie's mm-hmm. got it all. Yep. Yeah. Me myself. You can find me all my stuff on Legion. This show and Cinnamon Beef Podcast. Um, Blood from the Core. You could find on Legion Patreon only. We we just record a brand new show. Um, we took on X. Me and Derek, and we did Combat Shock. And um, what was the other one now? Oh. Too Scared to Scream, we did it as a double bill, so that'll be one episode, and then Derek and I are going to record uh, something for the main feed, uh, a Bridge and Tunnel episode, this time going to Connecticut for Beetlejuice, so look look forward to that, and uh, the one after that, because it's already been scheduled, because we're going to stockpile these bitches, y'all, just so I can get more content out to you guys, we're going to record Basket Case with, with, with Carly. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't know. I'm not sure how Carly feels about Basket Case, so it's just gonna be a nice surprise. <laughs> you know? Wow. Um. Yeah, more uh, cinema beef uh, coming. Everything coming in in, in two week uh, increments. This will be every two weeks, as long as we keep it up. And blood from the core will be every two weeks, as long as we keep it up. All the stuff, as long as we keep it up, it'll be coming every two weeks. Um, don't, you, I, don't you still have some lingering 31 days of Halloween? Yeah, I have some. Ridiculous. Which Yeah, that, I'm going to talk about that right now, actually, because I have those supposed to be out. Stuff happened in my life, so I'm going to re- 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 release those as like a compilation. Yeah, just, mm-hmm. just or, or maybe like filter the... I haven't decided yet. I, I either gonna filter them within the current episodes, like hey, here's here's Lee and and, and Lady Lee do, doing a, a review of this, and you'll hear it, you know, between reviews on the other, on the main show. I, right. I haven't decided how, what I'm gonna do with those, but I'm definitely gonna put them out. Just people put put work into them, and I appreciate that. And uh, you will definitely hear the rest of those. And um, I just haven't decided how to release them yet. I'm just I. I'm contemplating. It'd be fun to put them in the, within the current and the beef episodes. I think, though, this is when I'm gonna go about it, and uh, look for that in future episodes, including the one we record next week with Derek. I think so. It, it's a a lot going on in my brain. It, it's fine though. It's, <laughs> a, it's all good shit in my brain. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. 
Um, but that's the end of this one. Uh, we'll see you next time. If you guys uh, join the Legion Patreon, we mentioned that already, yeah, that episode. But the next main episode on the main feed will be Southern Comfort. It should be a good conversation. Um, and if you do another Patreon episode for that one, and I don't mind at all, it'll be it'll be Cameron's choice. So Cameron, think about that, brother. What you what you would okay. uh, do for that for that? And uh, for a companion piece to Southern Comfort, I'll think about that. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> But um, we'll see y'all next time. This has been the last call. Of torchies, t- t- tor- tor- I almost said tortures. Torchies, <laughs> and um, we'll ride again and see you guys soon. Bye bye. Later. <laughs>